from the creators who brought you RuPaul's Drag Race and Million Dollar Listing. This is World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Wow Report for Radio Andy. I'm producer Blake Jacobs, and now usually this show is hosted by Wow's fearless leader, Fenton Bailey, our chief creative officer, Tom Campbell, and the editor of the Wow Report, James St. James. And they're all still here this week, but this week we're switching it up a little bit. We're going to talk about the 10 recent documentaries that made us go, wow. Let's jump right in with our brand new documentary, Frock Destroyers, colon, the Frockumentary. It's now streaming on Wow Presents Plus, and you can sign up at wowpresentsplus.com. Now, number 10. Number 10. Steve Sims is a VP of Wow Presents Plus. And thank you so much for having me, guys. Hey. Tell me, what is a what in the name of Jiggins is a frockumentary? Well, a frockumentary is the four episode story of the Frock Destroyers, who were the girl group winner of RuPaul's Drag Race season one, featuring Bag of Chips, Blue Hydrangea, and Davina DeCampo. And essentially what we did was we followed them through 2020 into 2021 during the height of the pandemic since DragCon 2020, which was the last DragCon, uh, I'm sorry, DragCon 2020 UK, which was the last DragCon. And then we, you know, after that, the idea, you know, Randy, Fenton, Tom, you guys had the idea of doing an album following the frocks further into their journey. We started documenting it like we would for most of our shows and projects. And then the world shut down. And we thought it would be fun to kind of just utilize this source of communication and and video recording, uh, Zooms, video streams, and follow their journey and have a couple small camera crews along the way. And that ended up being four episodes of what we're calling Frock Destroyers Frockumentary. Without a spoiler alert, I watched uh, episode four last night. And it was so good. Just just the joy it brought me to see Baga and Blue and Davina. I mean, what a trio. And just the clips of them performing at DragCon, literally, you know, days before the world shut down, the frenzied seats, all I could think of was like, who in that audience had COVID? Because you know someone did. You know? <laughs> I, I think about that a lot when we came back from the UK, but it's honestly like, I remember being in that moment and standing next to Kelly uh, and just looking down and being like, this, I mean, this looks like Coachella. Like it just looked... Right insane and to think like well now they have to go on tour and they have to do more stuff and then a month later we were all at home i will go out with my 1960s ancient comparison but i thought their performance the frog destroyers performance at DragCon uk was like the beatles i i had not seen such frenzy from the crowd it blew i was not there in person i've just seen the documentation of it and it blows your mind it's funny, a lot of the raw footage from episode four that Fenton just watched is, it, not to spoil anything, but is their live performance where it ended up in 2021. And going through the raw footage, I mean, people crazy over Baga, like the Beatles. Or it reminds me of when we did the Britney Spears documentary and just her being through Vegas and like crowds of people chasing after her. I, it, it's Bag of Chips. It's so fantastic. <laughs> But yeah, it was a great, it was a really fun project. And, you know, for Wild Presents Plus to be able to have a, a, another Wild Doc that's a series and it also different than just, you know, Work the World or God Shave the Queens. I mean, this definitely took a deep dive into something that we all lived through. Mm-hmm. And we got to see the adventure of these three amazing drag queens and what they did from everything from home to in this bubble to out in the world when they were able to get released. And Leland and Freddie Scott are recording them from L.A. I mean, it's really is it's coast to coast. It's a global sensation. The whole thing, uh, and, and you guys did a great job of putting it together. I can't wait for the world. I, to it's nice to see what they were doing during the pandemic because you know Blue and Bagger both have been on um, Drag Race UK versus the World, right? So you can watch this series and see what they were getting up to before that. And I think the seeds were sown, don't you think, Tom, for the treasonous exploits and hijinks that went on in Drag Race yes. UK versus Wild. You know? And I have to also, I'm a huge Davina, Davina DeCampo fan, and it's great to see her. I want to see more of her, but it's great to be with her. The three of them together, they really are a group. They really they really do represent all these different kinds of attitudes and drags, and they're, they're a winning combination. 
Well, thank you, Steve. Thank you for all that you do. Where it presents plus, there's oh, so many well. great originals and more to come. We've reached number nine on the top 10 recent documentaries that made us go, wow. Here it is. Number nine. I watched a documentary on HBO Max called about the Beanie Baby phenomena of the 1990s. Um, and it is, uh, it's the anatomy of a super fad. It breaks down all the elements that happened that made it a perfect storm of, uh, of an economic bubble that just had absolutely no basis in reality. And, you know, you talk about like um, uh, crypto, you talk about like junk bonds in the 1980s, but you really have to go back to the tulip mania of the 1600s to have mm. a phenomena in which so something uh, literally is made out of absolute nothing and the price just goes up and up and up and up and up. And what happened was in the late 80s, the Titan, the guy who created them, uh, would create just a set amount, you know, like, you know, like he, they'd come out 12 at a time and he wouldn't sell them to Toys R Us or Walmart or any of the or Macy's or any place. They only went to Hallmark stores, mom and pop stores, mom and pop privately owned drug stores. And it made it so that you had to actually seek them out. You couldn't just go and, and grab. You had to like literally go and find where they were. And there were five women five housewives who lived in a cul-de-sac in, um, in, in a suburb of Chicago, and they started buying them up in bulk. And they started calling around the, the town or to the surrounding towns, so all the drugstores, all trying to find them. And then they would go and they started going all over the state, these five women, and buying them up in bulk. And then they started going on local TV talk shows talking about them, local TV news shows. And then they started branching out to Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, uh, Colorado, Tennessee. And they would go and all of a sudden it started build up like other housewives started catching on that they wanted to do. it. Other mothers would buy them for their kids. And it's basically these five women who then went on to um, Good Morning America and People Magazine did a story on one of the women and that's when it broke. And all of a sudden it started, uh, the secondary market is what um, was what really started happening where you would buy them for $12 and then you'd sell them pre-internet, but pre-eBay, you would sell them in the classified ads for $100, $200, $300, $400. And that started elevating the secondary market. And once that broke, once that started breaking, then it all hell broke loose. And by the end of the nineties, it was a, you know, hundred billion dollar industry that just could not sustain itself. And then all of a sudden one day someone bought one for less than it was worth and someone else started doing it and do it, started doing it. And then the bubble burst and everyone who thought that they had, they were going to send their kids to college and they were going to retire on these, on their beanie babies lost everything. And the end, the, the, the interviews with these five women are just absolutely, they're just these, these, you know, Midwest housewives with their big 80s hair and they are telling the story of how they inflated the market and how they started the fad and it's just an absolutely fascinating documentary I recommend everyone watch it did you guys ever own a beanie baby I was not into it. I never quite got it. And it's funny because they, the, the, the super fans, you know, like they're, they're, they go to like conventions, you know, Beanie Baby conventions, and the people will hold one up and they'll say, look at that face. Those eyes are so expressive. And the expression, you're like, you, you can just see what they're thinking. And it's like just this like weird little blob <laughs> of felt and buttons. It's just so weird that, the, that people read into it the way that they did. Now, I always thought that Ty, the founder engineered the bubble. I didn't realize it was well, five housewives he, who he sound did, like, from what you're saying, had nothing to do with the company. Well, he the, by by placing them in mom and pop stores, he knew what he was doing. And then by releasing them in, you know, in batches of 12, and then he would retire some of them. And once he started retiring them and, and stopping them from being, you know, taking them off the market, that's when they started becoming more and more valuable. But I love so it was the secondary was, market, the black market that changed everything. Yeah. So so it was a little bit wasn't... it was a little bit of him. It was a little bit of these housewives. It was a little bit of the secondary market. It's it all was the, like I said, it was a perfect storm of everybody sort of creating this super fad. But in the secondary market, he wouldn't have made any money. So I guess and his 
beanie business went bankrupt, didn't it? Did, or did he get out in time? No, uh, he ended up and in 2015 or 2016 or something like that. He was arrested for offshore. He ended up having an offshore account in Switzerland that had billions of dollars in it. And he was caught with that. But then he was just given a slap on the wrist. So he ended up he he did fine throughout the whole thing. They they never get to interview him because he's this sort of reclusive billionaire. But they keep trying to get into his circle and interview everybody in the circle uh, who works there. And that's it's just fascinating because he, he's a crazy coot. <laughs> that's Beanie Mania streaming on HBO Max. Let's see what recent documentary that made us go wow comes in at number eight. Number eight. On HBO. You can't watch it just yet. Um, it's coming to HBO. Here's the story. Navalny, a documentary about Alexei, Alexei Navalny, who is a Russian dissident who has oh. been giving Putin a horrible, horrible time. Well, haven't and, you spoken uh, about him before? You've talked have, about him before. Yes. Yes. He, did the, he has this fabulously popular YouTube channel, and he's got like six and a half million subscribers. You might also have heard of him because he was poisoned yeah. in Siberia. And he got on the plane to leave Siberia, became deathly ill. The plane made an emergency landing. He was taken off the plane. Long story short, went to Germany, where he was treated and recovered. He was poisoned with this thing called Novichok, which is a very clever poison that leaves your body after a certain amount of time once it's killed you. So if they use Novichok on you and they, you die. They can't autopsy. They, they can't find they it. They autopsy autopsy. And you're like, oh, he died of natural causes. Uh. But the twist is, I mean, it was a big headline story because he survived and he went back to Russia. The big twist is. The plan would have worked perfectly had the plane not made the emergency landing. So he became ill on the flight and they thought he would just die on the flight. But the <clears> plane <throat> diverted and landed. So he got medical help in time. And that's how he survived. This is an amazing documentary. Really but now, powerful. But by going back to Russia, which seems sort of counterintuitive to me, if the president of the of Russia is trying to kill you, why would you go back? But it James, worked in his favor because now everybody knows. Too famous to kill. Too famous too to fam kill. Yeah. yeah. But also, James, unlike you and me, he's profoundly committed to his cause and <laughs> is not going to step down. Honey, if someone poisoned me, I would just run away. I would just be like, okay, I'm going to stay over here. Well, I, would not have been in, I would not have been in Siberia in the first place. Thank you very well, much. <laughs> here's the thing. This is what is, this, but the film goes even deeper. So I didn't know this, but I will share it with you. They found a guy who was in Austria and he just did data hacking. And he would just buy data from people. And he bought data from, he got the phone records of the institute. There's one place in Russia where they make this poison. He got the phone records in the weeks leading up to the attack. He then managed from the phone records to get their driver's license numbers and addresses. Then he managed to get flight manifests. Long story short, he managed to piece together who bought the poison, who took it on the plane, who delivered it to, oh, uh -huh. to him. It gets even better. Because then when he doesn't die, what they do is they call up all the poisoners. Alexei Navalny calls up the poisoners and say, <laughs> oh, hi, I'm calling to see why you killed me. And then <laughs> most of them hang up. But one scientist, they prank him and they say, oh, I'm from the Politburo of blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm doing a report. Can you tell me what went wrong? And the scientist says, yeah, I know. He was supposed to die, but the plane diverted. <laughs> was the whole thing. It gets even better because they don't release that data, that call, until Putin gave a press conference and said, oh, you know, this is just an attention-seeking citizen. Uh, he won't even say his name. Putin won't say his name. And he says, you know, if someone had tried to poison him, they would have just killed him. You know, they wouldn't have like... And then he drops the phone call. Navalny drops the phone call of him talking to his would-be assassin, who's like, yeah, it kind of went wrong. It's jaw dropping it, it, it's it's i think this could be the oscar uh winner for 2023 
you know. Well, now when is it premiering, and when do we get to see it? And all yeah, that? it's coming to HBO in twenty twenty two. This later this year. The date hasn't been released. And who is yet. The, who is the director? Who did who did it? The director is he did that Robbie Robertson documentary, which apparently is also oh. really good. Daniel Ra, he's a Canadian, just twenty nine okay. years old. One he's a one phenomenal. Time. One quick question. Is, are there reenactments? And is there ever a moment where the stewardess takes her ring, opens it, and pours the poison <laughs> into the glass and then puts the ring back on? Very good point, Tom, because actually what is so incredible is that there are no reenactments because you don't need reenactments. Like when he goes back to Russia, they are watching live of all the people on the phone have their cell phones out. It's all streaming live everywhere all the time. And he does such a brilliant job of this whole thing feels so immersive and present without any re need for any reenactments. Well, it's but Tom also brings up another point. How did the poison get into into his drink or whatever? How do we know anything, any details? I believe they put it in his tea, but they also there's a, a, a slight subplot where they they put it in his clothes. They delivered clothes that have been impregnated with it after they interfered with the laundry. And there's a hilarious moment in the phone call where uh, Navani's asking the guy, he's saying, well, what did you do with um, his, the victim's clothes? And they said, oh, well, they, the police came and took them and cleaned them. And he was like, well, why did they clean them? And he was like, well, to get rid of the pro pro poison. And he said, well, any areas in particular? He said, yes, the underwear. And yeah. he's like, any area in the underwear? He's like, yes, the crotch. So it seems like they, they Death by dick poisoning. Dick poisoning. I mean, it's, it's, the whole thing is you cannot make it up. It is. And then, of course, when that came out, um, Putin and, and his sort of uh, uh, propagandists tried to say that Navalny had a, a Freudian fixation with his crotch area and was just looking for attention. So really... how your dick can make you sick. Story at 11. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's time for our first break. But first, let me tell you, we have all new shows coming to WoW Presents Plus this spring, including Why Are Humans, which is a post-apocalyptic docuseries that follows robots as they populate the Earth. And also, Vanessa Vanji Mateo is living her bachelorette fantasy in a brand new dating show, Vanji, 24 Hours of Love. Sign up for WoW Presents Plus at wowpresentsplus.com. This is the WoW Report for Radio Andy. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Hi guys, welcome back to the Wow Report for Radio Andy. This week we're doing things a little different. The guys aren't here, but I've compiled a list of the top 10 recent documentaries that made us go wow. We're up to number seven. Number seven. This is a, a long story. I'll try to make short, but I... You know how you follow? I follow a lot of people just to eavesdrop on their lives, and they let me. And there's a guy, David Mason, can't pronounce his last name, who owns Slick It Up, which is like high-end designer fetish wear. And I enjoy his posts, and I, I like him, and I judge him, and all those things. And through him, because I also see who people are, you know, I'm thirsty. I see who people are hanging with, and I befriend them. And if they're stupid enough to befriend me back, this is on Facebook, so it's mutual. There was a, there's this big giant like Hercules looking guy that's been modeling for him. So I follow him. He's a drag race fan. We don't talk, but I just get a sense that they seem like fun people, even though they're giant masculine he men. And the the Hercules guy put on Dave Mason's whose last name I can't pronounce his page. This is the movie I was telling you about, and it was a movie called. It was a link to a full length film on YouTube called When Betty Met May. When Betty oh. Davis met okay. Mae West. Well, this now, sounds right up our alley. Exactly. <laughs> the algorithm was working for me. So I click on it and it's it's based, it's it's sort of a, it's a reenactment documentary where um, uh, an actor, uh, you know, it, it, this is like five years old now, but he's a red vest and he has someone playing Bet, Bet, Betty Davis and someone playing Mae West. And they kind of look like them, you know, in that drag queen kind of way, but they're, they're women, you know, 
And he sort of he starts off by sort of talking by himself, the the maker of the film, and he says that I was uh, of you know I knew Betty Davis in the '60s, and and you know, and he sort of implies there's a bunch of gay people around Betty Davis, there's a bunch of gay guys around Mae West. They'd never met. They brought them together. And that night, I was bartender, and they t- and they took a picture. And we see the Polaroid of the real Betty Davis and the real narrator, you know, from the '60 from '65. And he said right before uh, May came into the house, I said to the, all the gays around shouldn't I tape this like on a cassette tape recorder? And they said, that's a great idea. So the movie is people lip syncing to the dinner party. Actual Betty Davis and actual Mae West. And it's really rough. And people give it like sort of like mean reviews. You know, it's not, it's not like it's a huge release, but it's fascinating. And the idea that somebody taking something that's such a prize, such a gift and making something of it, I guess. So, okay, that would be enough if the guy who made the film's name is Wes Whedon. And I'm thinking, is he on Star Trek? Like, why do I know the name Wes Whedon? Have I slept with Wes Whedon? Wes Whedon was... <gasps> Wes Whedon is my optometrist. What? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? The best story ever. <laughs> and when you go to see Wes Whedon, who's on Santa Monica Boulevard, he's been in many places, but he's like two downs from Circus of Books. Circus of Books... The haircutting place that's always been there, and then West Wheaton. It's very legitimate. He's so classy, he's such a good optometrist. He's, you know, a man <laughs> of a certain age, a little older than me, very well put together, very kind. And when you go sit in his office, you know, left, right, what's better, better. There's pictures of Elizabeth. Like he has worked with everyone. And now I have this, so I already had an appreciation for him. And I tell him I do drag race, and he's like, Oh, yes, mm-hmm. you know, but he is. He he was. Have you gone of, to? Have you, you have to go get glasses and talk to him about? I am going to go back. I am. I am. Uh, I adore him already. And now that I know that he made this film and that he, you know, he really has earned his stripes as as a a, a sort of like legendary gay lens, you know, lens crafter for the stars. Yes. So just so I'm clear, your optometrist had a dinner party, recorded Betty Davis and and, and May West. <clears throat> May West together, and then put a, made a film lip syncing to that audio. Yes. Yeah, he has an actor playing him. He has an actor playing, and there are actors recreating the entire event that they oh. use the tape recording as the soundtrack. So it's well, a lip sync. Where, 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 where can we watch this film? It's on YouTube. It's called When Bet, B E T T E, When Betty Met May, M A E Y. I'm not saying it's good. I'm saying it's fucking fascinating. And what shouldn't we all tape a dinner party and then make a movie about it 40 years later? Wasn't that what Warhol was trying to? I think Warhol would, would have that party, that show where it was all the parties and he would tape it. But, but anyway, but I, I, the bearing the lead here, first of all, how weird is it that Betty never met May in all their years I know. in Hollywood? And what was the, how what, how did they react to each other? I haven't seen the whole thing and I was going to watch it before I left, but it, but there's, it starts off with Betty saying they were supposed to meet at the Otto Preminger, like, you know, like festival, you know, like some kind of tribute to him. And Betty and, and May was like, was and feeling well, so she didn't want to give everybody her cold. I mean, it's very banal, but fabulous conversation, which I love banal conversation. Yeah, and Betty's like nobody was there, and then they cut to like a picture, <laughs> and it was a hall filled with like thousands of people. But Betty's like, nobody <laughs> was there. It was awful. We couldn't <laughs> wait to leave. But she was like, nobody <laughs> big was there. Um, so I- I'm gonna keep watching it, but it's it's fascinating. And I once I found it was West Whedon, I just like did a cartwheel in my in my home. That's crazy. <clears throat> That's in crazy. Hollywood, I mean, you can't swing a cat in this town without <laughs> hitting somebody who was friends with Mae West or, you know, <laughs> Betty Davis. It's just crazy. <laughs> All right, we're going to post that on the route report because it sounds must watch. We're talking about the top 10 recent documentaries that made us go wow, and now we're at number six. Number six. I watched The 24 Faces of Billy Milligan on Netflix, which is part of their Monster Inside series of uh, of insane of insane criminals. And Billy Milligan, Tom, I don't know if you remember this. He was it was a big deal. It was a very big deal. He it's the true story. This is a four part series. It's a true story about uh, the 1970s serial rapist Billy Milligan who raped four 
women on the campus of University of Ohio back in 1977 or something like that, I believe. Mm. And after he was captured, it was a huge like manhunt for him. And there were posters up everywhere. Have you seen this man? Blah, blah, blah. And after he was captured, his defense team realized there was something bizarre in his, in talking to him. And they brought in psychologists and prison psychologists and this and that. And they soon realized that he had DID, dissociative identity disorder, what was then known as multiple personality disorder. And this was around the time of Sybil. So it was a hot button issue. And the idea that there was a killer, or that there was a criminal out there with multiple personalities was national news. And you see all this footage of, you know, Walter Cronkite or, you know, you know all the news people talking about Billy Milligan, Billy Milligan. Well, um, he had in, in the beginning, they think that he has 10 personalities. And one of them is this elderly British man. And one of them is this Hungarian woman who speaks Serbo-Croatian. And his mother's like, I don't know where Billy still was. Billy never met any Hungarians. <laughs> and so, and then the one is writing Arabic and uh, and they take it to an Arabic expert. And they're like, yes, this is, this is real. And um, it's very weird. And over the course of these episodes, you you wonder, you, you know, that you have the prosecution and you have um, uh, his detractors and the victim's family who are all saying it's a con. He's he's not he doesn't have multiple personalities. Well, they bring in the author of Sil Sil Sybil, who is an expert, and she is the 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 therapist who worked with the actual Sybil. And she that says, would be no, Joanne Woodward's part in Sybil. Go on. Mm -hmm. No, that would be Sally Fields. Joanne Woodward was Three Faces of Eve, darling. No, but Joanne Woodward played the psychologist in oh, Sybil. Oh, that's right. Oh my God! And here I am trying to shame you, and you are absolutely correct. Oh my God. Um, that felt good. Anyway, Go on. There's also all this footage where you see Billy on camera, and you see him turning from one to the other and his eyes roll back into his head and he sort of shakes a little bit and then all of a sudden he's an older woman and then he does it and then he's like this sort of uh, zombie like guy and then he just goes back and forth and it's very creepy to watch you literally you get goosebumps because you feel that there's something bizarre happening there and the two things that i have to mention just very quickly is that whenever i watch one of these shows i become convinced that i have whatever it is that's going on. I convinced that I'm multiple personality, that James St. James and Jimmy Clark are completely separate. And I need to have some sort of uh, therapist fuse the two people together because Jimmy Clark's trauma is overwhelming James St. James's life. And so I'm like, can I become like very involved in these, these things? The other thing is that Billy Milligan looks exactly like my brother, like my older brother. And it's really creepy. They have the same exact eyes, that crazy. My brother had a very crazy look in his eyes. And it's very, but then everyone in the 70s sort of looked alike anyways, because they all had the same handlebar mustache and that awful hair and the bad skincare routine. So, so it, it's not that far of a stretch to say that, that Billy Milligan and my brother. So not to be a dummy, it's a, it's a documentary series it, or documentary yeah, special? Documentary, it's a true crime documentary series on Netflix. It's called Monsters Inside. And I then see. they do different things. And this is the 24 faces of Billy Milligan. Go, James Billy! James, I don't want to freak you out. And I don't want to say you have disassociated identity disorder. But you, but you know you're on, you know that you're on this show alone today, right? <laughs> right? You know you know Blake and Tom don't exist. <laughs> Who knew that I had a Tom Campbell personality? When you're when Blake when you're not around, James, we're not around. <laughs> <laughs> we're just for you. Uh. All right, now it's time for number five on the top ten recent documentaries that made us go wow. Number five. I want to tell you about a little, a, a short documentary, not a little one. It's a short documentary because, you know, it's the Academy Awards time of year. And there are two awards, one for the feature documentary, one for the short documentary. And over the past few years, the short documentary competition from being something that everyone ignored has become really hot. And Netflix and all, you know, the big players put in millions of dollars, far more than they ever paid to make the films in the first place to promote them and do screenings and what have you. So the other day, 
I was really uh, thrilled and honored and touched to be asked to do a conversation with Ryan White, the director of Coded, The Hidden Love of J.C. Landecker. This is a short film, and J.C. Landecker was the guy who created the advertising campaign for the arrow for shirts oh my god arrow yes shirts. oh my god i am obsessed with these with those 1900 that is a yes of the, the advertisements of the hottest men on the planet absolutely I you to those cartoon characters all the time well now you can go watch this short film on paramount plus and you can jack off you know <laughs> endlessly jc like kind of Yes, Dan. Yeah, yeah, go go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm jumping in. Go ahead. Tell tell the tell the story. Tell tell about the beautiful ads. illustrator artist, and he created the Arrow Shirt Man. And Arrow shirts in I think it was uh, 1899 went from being just another brand of shirts to the hottest brand in the marketplace. And his, if you haven't seen his work before, it's very much of the Gatsby era. It is the gil. It is the roaring. 20s you know that th that sort of captures that essence um it, there it just are all these very... impossibly gorgeous they're drawings of impossibly gorgeous men wearing these shirts and basically a little context is right before that was the gibson girl phase in which there were the 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 gibson women were these idealized women draw you know with illustrations of women that every woman wanted to be and this is sort of the the man that every man wanted to be a little it bit was kind that. of the beginning of photoshop and facetune keep going <laughs> I, I, well, actually, you're not far off there. You know, he would do these tableaus of like a man playing tennis and a woman and another man. And the two men would be looking at each other. Very homoerotic. Yes. Very coded. That's why it's called coded. And the other thing is, James, he Charles Beach was his lifelong partner. And he well, met so him he when he came to he model. For, he, he met Charles Beach when he came to model for him. And basically every man thereafter that he drew was a version of Charles Beach. So the wow. arrow, the man in the arrow shirts is the same guy drawn oh. again and again and again. Oh, romantic. So, so basically he knew that he was he was co he was coding for other homosexuals out there Ab at a time when there then that was just not done. Like nobody knew. He was but drawing those illustrations for you. James, I yeah. think the codedness worked in the sense that I think people of all sexualities responded to these beautiful models in these arrow shirts and wanted it. It makes me think a little bit of Calvin Klein and the Marky Mark campaign, yeah. you know, well, because that was very, very every, yeah. Every every male, every designer has taken a page out of this and knows that if you make it gay, then you'll you'll get <laughs> you'll get the eyeballs. Well, he was ahead of all that. He became incredibly yeah. rich. Um, very, lived a very great Gatsby lifestyle, had huge parties, and then it all came to an end. And that is what is so fascinating. Two things happened. Norman Rockwell came along and was a real fanboy of J.C. Landecker. And Norman Rockwell just said, oh, I just want to make people happy. And he drew those cutesy things that kind of took over. Landecker was fired from his main job, the Saturday Morning Post, and Rockwell oh. took over. And it's interesting that we know about Rockwell, but J.C. Landecker, his story is kind of not erased, but much less told. And that's partly because of this. When the stock market crashed in 1928, there was also a huge backlash against gays and lesbians. It happened in Hollywood, you know, with the movies. They drove the gays and lesbos out of the movies. You had the, the what was it, the code, the movie code yeah. came in. But it was interesting. It was a global retrenchment because at the same time, Germany was on the cutting edge of gay rights. And at the same time, you know, the Reichstag was the about Weimar to vote and on all of that, yeah. gay rights, right? And then in comes Hitler and that's the end of all that. But I, I just thought it was a well, fascinating but wait, But it does sort of seem that the difference between Landecker and, and Rockwell mm -hmm. is that there's so, Rockwell embodies that right-wing Republican. This is yes. the fantasy of how we want family to be. And we don't, you know, and, and we're going to push out anything that is a, a little suspect. You got it on the nose. That's exactly right. There was this sort yeah. of, not libertarian, but this live and let live feel about life. Hollywood was very gay. Germany was very gay. And then it all came crashing down in a huge backlash. And you have this sort of this other vision, this other fantasy coming to the uh -huh. front of sort of Norman uh -huh. Rockwell. Oh, that's just fascinating. Absolutely. It's a great film. Tragically, 
So they, you know, no more work, lived in obscurity, died, told Charles, his lover, to destroy all his work, oh. Oh, which he did. And fortunately, in the attic of his studio, there's a trunk that they missed. And that was found oh. years later. And that's basically all the work we have of his in terms of original work. Because who knows what was destroyed? And this is yeah. this is a story that curses so many gay artists and people that they living in a different time where it wasn't acceptable to be gay. They sort of participated in their own erasure. You know, so you did, much. There, there was no thought to in forty years this will be. You know, th there was no nostalgia cycle back then right. that people realized that they had a, would have a legacy. So they thought that they were just over and done, and nothing was ever to be done with. It's just so sad and tragic. Yes. Yes. You can watch Coded, J the Hidden Love of J.C. Leyenduck. It's actually streaming now on Paramount Plus. I will watch it tonight. I'm so excited. Okay, guys, it's time for another break. But I want to tell you about some more shows we have on our spring slate for Wild Presents Plus. We have Tartan Around, where Drag Race UK Season 2 winner Lawrence Cheney explores Tinseltown. Also coming up, Muff Busters. Rock M. Sakura and Heidi in Closet join forces to debunk all the myths moms used to tell us growing up. Sign up at wowpresentsplus.com. And we'll be right back. This is the Wow Report on Radio Andy. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report for Radio Andy. I'm producer Blake Jacobs. And I'm here by myself. Everyone's out on assignment this week. So I've compiled a list of the top 10 recent documentaries that made us go wow. And now we're with Tom at number four. Number four. Can't get enough of my Lucy, Lucy and Desi. I was over on Amazon, you know, seeing the uh, the Marvelous Mrs. Mabel, and, I, and they kept popping up that I should see the Lucy and Desi documentary done by Amy Poehler um, with uh, total permission and, and cooperation with Lucy uh, Arnaz, who is in Palm Springs, 70 years young, and, you know, and, and sort of the keeper of all the archive. You may, you know, during the making of this documentary is when... Um, Lucy Arnaz found the radio show that that Lucy did in '64, which I am still obsessed with, and learned so much. To me, um, talking with Lucy or something, this thing that's still the best thing I've seen or heard because it's Lucy talking with people, and you get a total sense of her style and her morals, and and she was on top of the world. Anyway, and um, so this documentary. I can't say it told me anything I don't already know. <laughs> but you are um, an expert. So I am an expert. And and Lucy Arnaz did an amazing documentary probably 20 years ago or more on CBS, where she showed home films for the first time and all that kind of stuff. But it's it's um it's 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 glossy, it's rich with photos, it um it tells their story, which if you don't know it, you should know it. And 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 it reminds me once again, because I don't really watch TV on the weekends like I used to. I Love Lucy is just the funniest fucking show. And there's so many moments that just blow your head, you know, your mind. It reminds you of that. What's interesting to me, and I don't care, I just noticed, you know, a big part of their relationship and the, and the, the solution of the relationship was Desi's cheating. And at best, it intimates it. It doesn't, it just doesn't go, and, and I don't want to air dirty laundry, but it was, it was, a little glossified that way. It's an Imagine a documentary, which I know you've worked with the gentleman at uh, Imagine. Yeah. And it's obviously a labor of love from Amy Poehler. It's lovely. And, uh, and, uh, and there you have it. I, okay. I, I, you know, if you, if you, if you haven't, I, I couldn't get through, I'm awful. I could not get through the, um, the movie because I am so deeply entrenched in the real deal. So this is, if you're looking for more stuff to um, sort of, uh, I Fix, fix you for your Lucy uh, cravings. Go there. I, I love you as our Lucy expert. And I just love the fact that these days you can get a podcast, you can get a documentary, you can get yeah. a feature, you can get, you can get your fix in all these different versions, you know, and they're Absolutely. all relevant, right? They all and have I a did love that the podcast on Turner Classic Movies about Lucy is excellent and worth seeing. And I will watch the movie at some point. I don't, you know, sometimes I loved it. I loved the movie. Not as much as I love the eyes of Tammy Faye, though, because as we know, Nicole Kidman is in competition with uh, Jessica Chastain for the best actress in the Oscar race. We but, talked about that last week, and we're we're feeling good for uh, we're feeling good for Jessica. She's doing yeah. a good job. 
Coming in at number three on the top 10 recent documentaries that made us go wow. Number three. Uh, I watched a documentary on Hulu called Kurt Vonnegut Unstuck in Time. And it is um, not only a biography mm -hmm. of, you know, the iconic great author who wrote Cat's Cradle and Slaughterhouse-Five and is just a, you know, beloved. <gasps> God, he's, he's just so iconic. But it's also the story of the director, Robert Wide, who it's his, it took 40 years for him to, to make this movie. He filmed, starting in 1980, he filmed right up to the uh, Vonnegut's death in 2007 and then sat on it for 15 years. Like, what do I do with all this footage that he has? And so it's sort of his story about his friendship with Vonnegut and how they travel around together and become really good friends. But what's fascinating, well, Vonnegut himself is just a fascinating, fascinating man. I mean, it he goes through so many tragedies in his life. His sister dies in just this horrific way. And her husband, uh, she's on her deathbed and her husband is coming to visit her and his train goes off the tracks and goes into the river and he drowns. And then when she, when they bring the newspaper to her about her husband, she dies 20 minutes later. I mean, and then he has to raise her five kids. Vonnegut has to raise her five. And like his mother died of suicide and the Big defining event in his life, of course, was in World War II when he was in an underground bunker in Dresden as the bombs rained down. And totally, I mean, Dresden, you know, is one of the great tragedies of the human civilization where they just took out the city. They just leveled the city. And he talks about coming out of the bomb shelter and seeing just the destruction of like what the violence that man can do. And that's of course the basis of slaughterhouse five is the bombing of Dresden. And so, but you have him talking about all these things and for every tragedy that happens, he tells these wicked jokes, these evil, nasty jokes, and cracks himself up and starts laughing until he's wheezing, weaving, wheezing and coughing and choking on the laughter. And they, after a while, it's like really disconcerting, you know, but he's like, what else are you going to do? You know what I mean? Like, you got to laugh or you're going to die. Absolutely. And, he's just, and, he's, and he's like, and that's throughout the whole movie. He's just talking to students and he's talking at book clubs and this and that. And he's just, I mean, a wicked, wicked man. And his jokes are so inappropriate and so awful, but he's just, he's just fascinating. And if you, I mean, I slapstick his book slapstick changed who i fundamentally am as a person when i was 14 and i read it it it's it's his most loathed book but it just it changed how i thought of art it changed how i thought of humanity it changed how i thought of just everything and so i'm a huge huge fan and if you aren't a fan pick up a book pick up one of his cat's cradles one any one of them and start and then watch this documentary. Today. I did a major high school term paper on Kurt Vonnegut novels. Like I, I, I should reread them because I'm sure there's one little, this is a tidbit. It's such a weird, but I don't even remember what it's from, but he was talking about how when you meet someone on a plane, you have a really good conversation. It means there was some science fiction word for it, that they come from the same place you do, like from before mm. time. And that when you die, you'll return to that place. But like you find like while well, you travel this earth, you find those people. And they said, that's why when some spouses die, their other spouse dies right away because they're going back to that place. I they're don't know. going back. They're rebooting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, Breakfast of Champions, Cat's Cradle, Dead Eye Dick. I mean, so many of these books are just so iconic and. He's just, it's, it's, we lost a real, he was a great living genius a giant in our time, you know? We have his work. We have his work. I love that. I'm going to read, should I read Slapstick? I don't think I've read any of his books. So Slapstick, yes. If you read Slapstick, it, it's, and it's so about now, it's the world after a pandemic and there's, oh. it, it's, it's just fascinating and funny and creepy and crazy and just i swear and to god fenton if you read slapstick and turn into james st james <laughs> i will never but, forgive either one of you you have to read the forward because there's a forward where he's talking about rolling around with his dogs and um how much he loves his dogs and then 
every single thing from the forward ends up happening in an allegory later on in the story. It's just it mind every time you see like a the phrase being used later on, and it is just fantastic. Oh wow! Okay, Kurt Vonnegut, number two. Number two. I watched uh, on Netflix downfall the case against boeing um really against boeing. Hmm? against boeing yeah against boeing you may remember that in 2018 oh um, wait i heard bowie as in david bowie no know. no david bowie in this i'm month. very sorry <clears throat> carry on carry boeing, on the airplane manufacturers yeah yeah you know every time you get on a plane james the chances are it's on a boeing plane and that's why you want to watch this documentary, or maybe you don't, because um, Boeing had a reputation for being the safest airline, uh, airplane manufacturers in the world. And, you know, they made the 747, they invented them, built the 747 and revolutionized air travel. And it was one of those crazy dreams, you know, it wasn't based on market research, it wasn't based on algorithms, it wasn't they just did it. They were going to build this plane and they built it. And it was the most amazing thing. Unfortunately, after Boeing was taken over in the eighties by McDonnell Douglas, their reputation for safety changed. It was all about keeping the share price up, Wall Street, what have you. And that shift in the culture manifested itself with the, uh, the Max jet. In 2018, they had in a row, pretty much in a row, two airplane crashes where the jet, the Max jet, the Super Max jet just plunged into the ground and obviously killed everybody on board. And I don't know if you read about this at the time, but everybody was like, why are these planes falling out of the sky? They were brand new planes. And so this documentary tells the story of what happened. Basically, Airbus were competing with them very successfully, and they brought out a fabulous jet called the Airbus Neo, and Boeing was caught on the back foot. They didn't have anything. So they went back to their, I think it's a 737, an old trusty model, and said, well, let's soup it up. Let's make it you know, more environmentally friendly, cheaper fuel. And they came up with the Max jet. And the whole idea was, it's a new jet, but it's an old jet. And because it's an old jet, you wouldn't need to go through all sorts of regulatory approval. You wouldn't need to do any pilot training, which is very expensive because the pilots have to go and go into simulators and they can't fly the planes. So they push through this max version of the 737 and say, you can fly it just like you've flown a 737. You can just get on and fly this plane. No, unfortunately not because the new green economic engines had to be mounted in a different way, which changed the whole weight of oh, the plane, right. which they fixed. They fixed that by introducing something called the MCAS. And the MCAS was a piece of software that would detect if your plane wasn't flying right and force the nose down. Yes, yes. I've been here. <laughs> I remember this story. Yes. Only problem is this would require pilot training. Yes. So they, Rather than do the pilot it. training, they didn't tell the pilots that yeah. this system was in place. And so no one knew flying the plane that an override would suddenly jump in, take control of the plane and plunge it into the ground. Yeah. Oh. And this happened not once, this happened twice. And Boeing at first said, because it happened in foreign countries like uh, Ethiopia and um, Indonesia, there was all this sort of assumption that these foreign people don't know how to fly their planes. And they kept on saying the plane was safe. The plane was safe. Of course. And it wasn't. They had 10 seconds from detecting this problem. They had 10 seconds to fix it. Fix something that they had never been told about. Yeah. Had no yeah. idea existed. Mm -hmm. And the second crash, they actually did know about it. They'd been told about it. And they did know, and they did what they were supposed to do, and it didn't work. Uh, well, it seems like, you know, it's, a, it's, it's sort of a miracle that it only happened twice. It seems like it could have just happened hundreds of times simultaneously, you know. Yes. I mean, terrifying. Actually could terrifying. Have, they knew, Boeing knew it could have happened with 15 planes over 35 years. But they, 
they had a document saying that and they were like okay you know great risk um, management it is the most horrible story and I, I wish i could say there was a sort of satisfying ending to the film in the sense that boeing got their just desserts but actually they no. didn't they no. had to pay 2.5 billion to avoid criminal prosecution. Well, that's a drop in the bucket. That doesn't hurt anyone. But too nothing big to fail. Too big to fail. They paid nothing to the families. They never. And then they probably all gave the themselves families. bonuses at Christmas. They never apologized to the families. Ugh. The CEO left a Boeing with a 60 million dollar bonus. They never apologized to the families. I, it just left me with a really bad. Taste you know, it's, it's, it's time yeah. to rise up and just eat the rich, man. Right. Just uh, down with everybody. Yeah. <laughs> so that is down for the case against Boeing, a really depressing documentary on Netflix. Okay, this is our final break before we find out the number one recent documentary that made us go wow. But first, I want to tell you about some more shows on our spring slate on Wow Presents Plus. We have season five winner of RuPaul's Drag Race, Jinx Monsoon, hosting everyone's new favorite sketch show, Sketchy Queens. Also, a brand new season of Uh, What More Did You Ask For? Sign up at wildpresentsplus.com, and we'll be right back with number one on Radio Andy. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report, things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report for Radio Andy. We've been counting down the top 10 hot docs that make us go wow, and we've reached number one. And it's Explant, Michelle Visage's documentary that's currently streaming on Paramount Plus. Number one. Yay! Oh, it's so exciting. Um, you know, it, this is a long time in the making. Thank God for World of Wonder listening to me and believing in me and wanting to take a chance on it because breast implant illness is something that a lot of doctors uh, still don't believe is real. So when I came to you, you guys had open ears and an open heart. And the more we dug into it with Jeremy Simmons, our incredible director, um, he was calling me and texting me and going, oh my God, oh my God. Like every day his mind was getting blown more and more by um, the lies and the deception and the untruths that we have been fed about breast implants and breast implant illness over the years. So it's been three years in the making, but here we are. Without giving the whole plot away, can I ask you some questions about your, your breast implant and explant journey? Sure. When did you first get your breasts enhanced? Well, I was in 90, a year very long ago called 1989. Uh, yes. Um, it was either 89 or 1990. One of the, I was in seduction. Um, so your I, breast implants were as old as Taylor Swift. Yeah. Oh, I think they might. Yeah. Yeah. The first set. Um, so I got them done all the way back then um, for a multitude of reasons, but mostly because I was told my whole life that I wasn't woman enough or feminine enough or sexy enough. So yes, I got them for me because I felt that way about myself and I didn't do it for anybody else, but it was because of the way that I was told and treated that made me feel that I needed to get them. So but you loved, you loved your, you loved your boobs for, for a oh, long time. Yes. yes. But when did they start causing you pain and when did you start realizing that they weren't maybe not worth? Um, looking back, they probably started, not probably, I was having health issues when the first, within the first year I was having heart palpitations and I, uh, my gynecologist sent me for uh, like an echocardiogram and a heart workup. And I was so young and there was no ill heart health in the family, no issues, no autoimmune issues, none of that stuff. So of course I was told, well, you should start meditating or um, maybe have a glass of wine at night. It was like, A, I don't drink. B, I, this is a physical manifestation. I'm not making this up. And it was right. an anxiety at that time. Um, that came later. So um, it started within a year. But of course, to, to cut to the chase of that question, 30 years, a multitude, let's say 30 doctors, not one of them, not one said, you know what? Maybe this could be a breast implant. Well, they wouldn't want to, would they? Because it's the number one cosmetic procedure in the world. I was so shocked about that. 
Correct. It used to be liposuction for many, many years. And then it, breast implants took over some years ago. But I had even said as a lay person doing all this research before there was a Google, I would say, if I have an autoimmune condition, right, and it doesn't run in my family, nobody's ever had Hashimoto's and it is a genetic thing. Um, I just find it really odd that the one thing that my body's trying to fight are my breast implants. Cause that's the invader that's there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And even then they're like, well, the FDA says they're innocuous. So we we believe them. And here's the studies. And it's like, but guys, I'm not even a scientist and this makes sense. It just makes sense. So what were the symptoms that you noticed? Was it localized pain around the breast or what, what, or is it a fatigue? Is it a, what, what is it? Zero pain. It presents differently on everybody. Some women do have breast pain. For me, it was a, a culmination. Like it started growing. It started with the heart palpitations. Then it went mm. to extreme hair loss, which then went to Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune condition, uh, brain fog, dry skin, weight gain. When I tell you I would eat nothing and still be gaining weight, I'd like to say that's my excuse now, but um, <laughs> um, uh, extreme fatigue, like to the point where like chronic fatigue and Epstein-Barr, they all play a part in this storyline connected to breast implant illness. Um, it, it the, the list is it's a litany. It just goes on and on. And the more I think about it, like anxiety, panic attacks, all of that stuff is all connected to breast implant illness. And before you even ask if it's saline is any better, it's not about the filling. It's about the shell. The casing of the implant is the yeah. toxins. In it. It's got 40 plus yeah. toxins in it and it won't happen to everybody, but we do deserve transparency to at least know that it is a possibility, including cancer. I have a really important question I want to ask for myself and on behalf of all Drag Race fans. Since you've had your breast uh, implants removed, can you tolerate the color green any better? <laughs> <laughs> I could tolerate it better. Weirdly, the implants came out and I started wearing green. The witness? I did not. I know, Tom, she's in a green environ. Her cushions on her sofa are green. <laughs> no, they're not, they're not. It's just a horrible light. They're white. Your glasses are green. Everything's green. They're not. They're beige, Fenton. So, so just put yeah, I see colors. gray. We're all seeing different colors here. I see oh my gray. God, I'm like the blue and black dress. <laughs> I see Merle Ginsburg, so I don't know what's going on. <laughs> oh, you're funny. I love an inside joke. Yeah. Well, X-Plant is uh, streaming now on Paramount Plus. So go see it. It's really a fantastic documentary, if I do say so myself. Well, actually, I do say so myself because I had very little to do with it other than just make sure it got done. But Jeremy Simmons did a fantastic job directing a new Michelle in it, our Stella. And um, yeah, it's got some really shocking things in it. All right, that's it for our list of the top 10 recent documentaries that made us go wow. Tune in next week when all the boys will be back. And until then, go out and do something that makes the world go wow.